Hola a todos, bienvenidos a un nuevo Q&A en esta sexta edición de Indivo, que ahora migra al terreno digital. El día de hoy estamos con Andrés Borda y Camila French, directores de Sufi Saint and Swinger, a película que se estrena hoy en la plataforma de Movies y que estará disponible hasta el día de sábado. Andrés, Camila, ¿cómo están? Bien, David, Bien, ¿cómo estás? Qué gusto verlos. ¿Desde qué lugar del mundo están? Casi cada <risa> Para presentar una película hecha sobre un eh, norteamericano que fue una celebridad de televisión en Irán, uh -huh. producido por un productor británico y co-dirigido por mitad de inglesa, mitad de china, Camila. Una maestra de todos. Entonces, estuve... Fantástico. Bienvenidos a, a, a esta discusión online que, que mucho promete, ya que hoy contamos con la presencia de Abbas, el productor, que le voy a dar bienvenida a continuación. Abbas, ¿cómo estás? Hola, muy bien. Gracias. Obrigado. <risa> Obrigado. <risa> y a ah, la sorpresa que nos enteramos ayer desde el equipo de Indivo, el señor Mr. Lloyd Miller. Hola, amigos, amigas. <risa> How are you? Bien, ojalá. <risa> <¿Cómo están? risa> bueno, antes de empezar, voy a empezar con la introducción en español. A uh, Sufi Saint and Swinger es una película uh, que se estrenó el año pasado en un festival en Alemania, si no estoy mal. Eh, Womex, en Womex fue como la premier internacional. Womex es un festival más musical que, que cinematográfico. Sí. Oui. sí. Uh, Sufi Saint and, and Swinger, y Swinger, uh, it, uh, it was, just a minute. Um, no, 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 Sí, correcto. Eh, eh, como, como les venía contando, a uh, Sufficient as Winger es, es, un, es, es bien adaptada de un libro que escribió Lloyd, pero que, como, como el mismo Lloyd lo dice, no fue publicado. Uh, adicionalmente, la película se constituye a partir de un extenso e increíble material de archivo que realmente parece mentira y creo que ese es parte del encanto de la película porque se construye a partir de, de secuencias que son realmente confusas pero que se acompañan del talento musical de Lloyd y de la persona que le está contando también en tercera persona. Mi primera pregunta uh, para Andrés y Camila es ¿Cómo llegan ustedes a esta historia? ¿Cómo llegan ustedes a Lloyd? ¿Cómo llegan a Abbas? ¿Y cómo llegan a todo el extenso material de archivo que tiene la peli? <risa> bueno, eh, bueno, antes que nada, gracias David y gracias a Indio por haber invitado a esta película, que, que es un placer estar acá con ustedes. Y bueno, a Abbas lo conozco desde el año 2009 en Londres. Yo terminé de estudiar cine donde estudiamos con Camila en Londres. Y con Abbas trabajé en muchos proyectos de documentales cortos sobre artistas plásticos. Y eh, un día Abbas me contó sobre Lloyd y decidimos hacer, hacer, eh, hacer una película sobre él. Él llevaba investigándolo mucho tiempo, lo conocía desde hace un par de años. Y Abbas es eh, oriundo de Irán. Eh, y Lloyd fue, como sale en la película, una tele, celebridad de televisión en Irán y además el precursor de un género musical que se llama un, un subgénero, que es el Oriental Jazz, el jazz oriental. Eh, así que conocí a Lloyd en, en Salt Lake City y luego con Camila fuimos allá y tuvimos un, pasamos unos muy buenos, un buen, buen tiempo con ellos, en donde antes de, de comenzar a grabar, Lloyd nos pasó un poco de archivo, de música y de ideas, y nos pasaba, él es fanático de las USBs, y él lleva USBs donde tiene todo su material, USBs con sus fotos, con su música, y en una de esas USBs estaba Sufi Saint and Swinger, su libro, que es un libro que él escribió de, contando su vida, es un libro muy extenso, eh, de 500, 600 páginas, en donde él cuenta su vida, pero en tercera persona, entonces eh, nos pareció muy divertida la narración que él tenía, y él tiene una manera muy particular, muy eh, divertida, muy, 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 muy particular de contar su historia en ese libro. Y decidimos que el foco del, de la narración y de la película que vamos a hacer con Lloyd y sobre la vida de Lloyd iba a estar fundamentado en ese libro, en fragmentos que nosotros seleccionamos y en el trabajo de archivo y musical. Fantástico. Sí, um, okay. 
empezamos a leer el libro de Loi y decidimos desde ahí explorar todos los archivos que tenían en oh, the basement. En el eh, sótano. En el sótano. Y Catherine nos mostró <risa> una montaña de cajas lleno de archivos y pff, sí, empezamos ahí. Catherine, pues, es la un viaje. Catherine es la esposa de Lloyd. Sí. La esposa de Lloyd. Sí. Sin ella esta película más, era imposible. Más que mi esposa. Catherine que a life partner. Mm -hmm. Fantastico. Yeah, she's, um, she's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, ahora, una pregunta para Abbas. Now I go to you, Abbas. Um, I would like to know in which moment, uh, I, I, I know for sure that you were researching uh, Mr. Lloyd for a long time, but in which moment uh, you met Andres and Camila and say, Okay, it's a good idea of make a film of a book of 500 pages uh, with an extensive material, archive material. And, and you say, okay, this is a good idea. Let's make a film of this. And yeah, not yeah. only make a film of this, we are making a documentary with uh, some fiction, low key related. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. No, How no it's, it's, it definitely comes together like movie? that. It's It, it comes together like that, you know, either in a PR uh, or, you know, written by a big production company or a TV play. It doesn't really work like that because fundamentally it's a creative journey, right? I mean, really fundamentally it is 100%. Otherwise it, it has no meaning, right? And, uh, and, and, and since we're not getting paid a vast amount of money, uh, then that's all you have left. Um, and So for me, it was that, you know, I watched a lot of, a lot of TV in Iran when I was in the 70s um, there. And so I was, you know, Lloyd for me was part of an echo. Um, and, but I, I, was, I was more interested in the relationship between, um, between the work and the life of Lloyd um, as, as a human being. When in conversation with someone like Andres and and uh, and wonderfully uh, bringing in also Camilla, because I had seen the way that Andres had worked um, with uh, a Norman Mejia, a project that we had done with a, a fantastic and equally incredible and colorful human being um, in Colombia, and I thought, you know, it, it, it was a puzzle for me. So I didn't know how to solve it. I, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, fully, you know, as a producer, you don't come to things with an answer. You come to things with questions and you're looking for other people to help you answer the question. So the idea of the book, uh, the idea of working through, walking, walking in Lloyd's footsteps, but feeling an, an, an emotional relationship with Lloyd um, uh, is, uh, is something that, that was necessary because every other way of approaching this project didn't work. It kept coming up empty. And how do you get to the soul of something? Well, it's, it's through Lloyd, it's through his writing. And no one else had ever thought of doing that. And I think that is where we have to congratulate uh, Andres and Camilla and uh, Lloyd and Catherine because that really and was a very special moment. I, I, I'm pretty, Uh, and then, but it's, uh, you know, that is, the, that is the alchemy that was required. It, if, if we had known this before the project, um, it would have made it in a way artificial. So you shouldn't know the answer when you enter this project. You should only know the questions and, uh, and be open to asking the questions. And, uh, and that's why it took a long time to, to go through the journey and in particular through the journey of editing, because I think we always continue to ask questions and, and we are glad to have the opportunity to have had a journey through Lloyd's mind. And I think, I don't know how Lloyd feels about that, <laughs> but there we are in Lloyd's mind. I've been for thinking a about it. You know? I, I've been thinking about it. I was thinking about the book and sometimes I go through and, and read just to see what it said. And I'm thinking, you know, I just said it like it was. I didn't try to plan it. I didn't, oh, what if somebody reads it and they find out about themselves that they were 
they stayed overnight with me. Oh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm embarrassed too because I, I start stop doing that stuff. But okay, so uh, find out the truth, no matter how brutal and how grim it might be or how wonderful. And just to say it like it is and say it like it was and hope that people will see themselves in a way that, yeah, my life's the same way too. I've been hiding a lot of stuff or I've been telling a lot of stuff that's exaggerated, but maybe it's just a plain old whatever happened is even more interesting and more powerful because it's real. And so I just went ahead and said it like it was and let everybody be mad, you know, or <laughs> happy or whatever. The archive is the, is, the, is the element of the cinematic. It's where the words and the images connect together to give you a necessary emotion that has no words, right? That's the images of, of, right. of, of Lloyd, the music. That was the, 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 the directorial element, the, the editorial element of Andres and Camilla when it came to, to that thank part you. of it. And I think that's, uh, and yeah, thank you. And, and, but in particular, the work that, she, that Catherine did with Lloyd in terms of bringing that material together, which is unique and special, incredibly special, because in, the, in between the words and, and, and the, the images, there is something special that is created. And I think that's always one thing that I, I, as a producer of film, I, I yearn for. I, as a viewer, as a, as a member of the audience, uh, in any film and anything, I yearn for it because it isn't in the image and it isn't in the words. It's somewhere, it's somewhere created by those elements. So that, that was something that the archive really helped us do. Okay, point in time. Do you feel with this, uh, with this fact that you've, uh, you've shared with us, that people who see it will maybe suddenly sit in the back row of the theater chatting and, and suddenly come to a realization, hey, this is life and this is a guy telling his good and bad stuff the way he felt it and the way it was, coloring it up or without anything. And uh, this is kind of interesting and yeah, I like it. I don't know if they're going to suddenly decide that it's cool or because it isn't part of what's going on now, what's going on is, you know, the pop scene, pop music and pop films and oh, it's gotta be this way and that way. And so everybody be happy. But um, if something isn't that way, I wonder if it's gonna be refreshing or just kind of stunning, shocking and disappointing. I don't know, I guess we'll see one of these days, some film festival, suddenly it might make it. And uh, you guys will get some credit for that, which is good, finally. Uh, and. Uh, then maybe I'll be happy that somebody got it. You know, what do you think? David, do Someday, you, maybe after I'm. ¿Quieres eh, traducir o quieres que yo traduzca un resumen cortico, obviamente, lo que. Si quieres un resumen cortico, igual yo creo que a ambos se nos va a pasar. Se nos va a pasar. Entonces, si quieres, yo te complemento y, y empiezo. Dale. Pues básicamente lo que, lo que Abbas dijo es, es que él no, cuando trabaja con alguien, busca es. Eh, él llega con unas preguntas y busca a alguien que lo ayude como a armar el rompecabezas y en el caso de Lloyd eh, digamos que el rompecabezas es complejo, la historia de Lloyd es, tiene muchas capas es una historia que cuando vean la película o para quienes la hayan visto sabrán que es una historia que tiene eh, tiene muchas capas, tiene capa política capa musical, capa de la infancia y, y digamos que, que nuestro trabajo como realizadores y directores fue lograr entrar a esa historia sin prejuicios y lograr entrar a esa historia de una manera en donde pudiéramos realmente como intentar como captar las, las distintas capas de Lloyd, pero no entrevistando a muchas personas. A esto se paró. Te estamos oyendo. Sí, ah, bien. Pero estás, estás, que te quedaste así. Que la, no, ah, bueno. eh, distintas capas eh, y nosotros tratamos justamente como de conseguir eh, eh, poder contar todas estas distintas capas de la narración de Lloyd de una manera que fuera orgánica y justa con él sin y desde adentro. No entrevistamos a un montón de personas, no entrevistamos a X, Y, Z, sino que simplemente nos quedamos con Lloyd y desde Lloyd fue que contamos como la historia, esa fue la decisión que tomamos con, con Abbas y con, y con Camila. Voy a reiniciar la cámara. Sí, igual. Sí, igual, ok. <risa> no, claro, pero sé que es la... <risa> sí. Ok, let's try it again. Nada, no wow. sé. Bueno. Listo. Uh, I, uh, 
el capilar psicológical, psicológico. Algo así. Is that no, such a word? No, no, no sé qué decir, pero bueno, si quieres sigue, David. Bien, uh, aparte de lo que tú mencionaste, uh, Abbas también comenta que, pues Abbas tiene un crecimiento, pues creció también en Irán, y parte de, de crecer viendo a, a Lloyd en televisión y parte de crecer viendo la cultura pop en, en Irán durante esta época, hizo que fuera un proyecto que fuera de total motivo e interés para él. Y cuando se encuentra con Camila y cuando se encuentra con Andrés, le dan forma y le dan vida a esta historia, que con la ayuda de, de Lloyd y de su extenso material de archivo, logran darle forma, y no solamente darle forma porque existe un extenso material de archivo, sino porque a partir del relato literario de Lloyd contado en tercera persona, la película también toma forma. ¿Correcto? Eh, siguiendo esto, quería preguntarles una cosita a Andrés y Camila. ¿En qué momento del montaje ustedes empiezan a decir o a darle forma a, a un hilo narrativo? Porque la película, curiosamente, tiene un hilo narrativo. You know, has a narrative uh, style and it's very particular. Y quería preguntarte, sé que trabajaron con Juan Soto, un reconocido montajista acá en Colombia, que estoy seguro también los guió como en ese proceso de, 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 de darle también una identidad a la película. Y es que no solamente se cuenta en tercera persona, sino que aparte construya todo un metarrelato sobre la vida de Lloyd, que, que creo que es lo más fantástico de la película. Cuéntame un poco sobre este proceso del montaje y cómo descubren ustedes la película en ese proceso de, en ese proceso de edición. Fue con la silla, ¿no? Pues eh, nosotros acabamos de tener a nuestro, a nuestro hijo cuando estábamos editando la película. Había nacido, nos, nació en Londres en enero y comenzamos a editar ahí con Juan, Juan estaba en Londres, y lo conocí a través de, de unos buenos amigos nuestros, que son Nicolás Ordóñez y Beth Lian, ellos nos conectaron con Juan, ellos son como la productora detrás de La Defensa del Dragón, por ejemplo, uh -huh. y eh, conectamos con Juan, y nosotros íbamos todos los días en el metro con nuestro recién nacido hijo a editar la película, <risa> íbamos en el metro, editamos con Juan y volvíamos. Eh, pero el proceso de montaje digamos que tuvo dos etapas, una con Juan cuando estuvimos en Londres, que fue realmente organizar el material, y otra ya después eh, con Abbas en particular, en donde miramos más cómo trabajar el tema del archivo y cómo realmente traerle el archivo a, a, a la vida digamos que la línea narrativa de la película ya estaba establecida por por el, eh, por el libro el libro ya nos daba con la línea narrativa y además el juicio que, que como que va como anticipándose a lo largo de la narración. Hay unas voces de un radio que nos comienzan a, a anticipar que Lloyd sufrió un, un juicio más adelante en su vida. Eh, esas ideas llegaron a partir de, de experimentar y experimentar con el, tanto con el, el material, sobre todo editar el libro, o sea, reducirlo a lo más significativo y... Y ya después sí encontrarle el ritmo, no solo del archivo, sino musical a la película. Comenzar a dejar que la, que la música respirara más. Primero era como encontrar el archivo, familiarizarnos y trabajar toda la, toda la línea narrativa. Y luego fue permitir que la música respirara para nosotros poder darle como ese ritmo. Eso fue un trabajo que realmente ya lo hicimos más eh, con, en, entre Camila, Abbas y yo. Ya después de que Juan, Juan hubiera... Juan estuvo, digamos, con la primera mitad del, del proceso y la siguiente mitad estuvimos nosotros eh, por nuestra cuenta. Porque Juan es un editor excelente, pero también es un editor muy costoso. Estoy seguro. Sí. Ok, uh, now I will go directly to Mr. Lloyd. Hi. Um, I have a question. The film is fantastic. The film uh, exposes who are you uh, almost narrated by yourself. So it's, 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 it's a film who narrates in third person, who are you and how do you feel about yourself, right? Now, I would like to know more about your life and for instance, how do you get to become a host, a TV host in Iran, for instance, in the 70s? And that's, that's a question that I have always, uh, <laughs> that was there when I was watching the film. That's a question. A question I always had, I thought, is it the CIA? No, is it the <laughs> the Russian? They wanted to make me look foolish or something. And maybe they want to make me look good since I wasn't very pro-American. It, it, it was every kind of thing could have been possible. Was it the Shah? Because he, I had something 
because I kind of liked him, even though some people didn't, and he had some faults. Well, don't we all? I mean, you know, Trump, everybody's got him. And so uh, <laughs> some a little worse than others. But so I, I just wondered, what was I doing there? Was I a, a symbol of something? Then I said, well, as long as I'm here, I'm just going to be a symbol of what I am, which is I don't give a darn about anything, and especially uh, governments, and especially my own. Tell because about your name. Uh, oh, yeah, my name, of course, there was a story about that. How did I get Kurosh Ali Khan out of Lloyd Hello? And, well, it was in Geneva. My Iranian friends, they said, uh, you were telling me in Persian, you've got to have a Persian name. I mean, come on, you speak Persian, you are Persian, you think Persian, you got to have a Persian name. So they started coming up with possibilities, and one said, oh, uh, why don't we have um, Ali? You know, he's the greatest... Uh, spiritual master in, in Iranian history. And I says, well, how about Kurosh? He's a political guy. And then we were talking about it, and I says, well, what's wrong with Kurosh Ali? And they said, oh, you can't put them together. That's like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what we could have in English where we put together a Welch and a, a Spanish name together in somebody's name. Um, you know, I don't, I was just thinking of what could it be? I, I don't, we've probably seen that, and it's kind of a joke. Everybody laughs when they hear it because two names together that don't belong politically or uh, socially or racially. So Kurosh Ali, come on, dude. How can you have a Kurosh Ali? I said, well, they're both the, the, the best in their field. And so why not just have those two names? And then I said, well, I'm going to throw in Khan so that the, uh, you know, the, the Turkey people won't feel left out. And it'll kind of cover everything about Iran, both Persian and uh, mm -hmm. Islamic and uh, Turkic. And so everybody kind of laughed and said, yeah. So every time I told my name, Kurosh Ali Khan, since it was so weird, they never forgot. And they they used it when they talked about other to other people. Oh, that's Kurosh. Cool. <laughs> and, and so, so they I all may... remembered me that way. So it was kind of, that's how I got sort of famous. Not that if I may yeah. add, that was the name of the title of his TV show was Kurosh Ali Khan and Friends. Kurosh Ali Khan or So it's Star? sort of weird. I was telling someone the other day, it's sort of like B.B. King. Like, you know, it's a word and a name you don't forget because it has kind of an odd sound to it. So Kurosh Ali Khan and Friends was his television show. Yeah. So when you it's have kind a, of funny. when you have a name that's kind of easy to remember like that, then you can become famous. <laughs> it's not because I'm any good. Although it is kind of unusual that somebody, uh, somebody would play any instrument and, and and I surprised myself. I didn't know I could play that. So, so one day somebody brought me a French horn. It was I played some trumpet and valve trombone, so I knew the valves do a little different in a French horn because they, they do different things than the valves on a trumpet. But they handed it to me and I pooped a couple of notes and I said, okay, let's go, let's do a show. So I played it just as if I was uh, an expert. And since I pretended I was one, I became one without knowing. And I, that happened to me many a time. Uh, like I would wonder, how am I doing this? Like they'd hand me a cello. They said, can you play this? I said, well, I played a few notes on the bass. And so I plinked around a bit. And then I said, oh, I'm going to play it like this cello player in LA who was uh, a, a master soloist and he go blah, 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 like that all over the place like it was a trumpet. So I just said, well, I'm going to just do it. Just did it. So it was like smaller than a bass. So I just, my mind sh shortened my finger spans to about there. And then <laughs> I just did the same thing I do on a bass except shorter, closer together. And so you can let your mind make you do stuff. Like if your mind knows how to speak French or, or, or Italian or something like that, but you don't know Spanish, well, it's in between the two somewhere uh, or after or somewhere, wherever you want to put it, but you can let your mind change all the words in your head. So when you say a French word, it comes out Spanish instead of uh, French or Italian. So your mind can do miracles because it's got the ability to do it if you stop and think. Well, if you don't have time to stop and think, you just let it go on its own and let it loose and let it go crazy. It'll do stuff that you never even dreamed you knew how to do. And so ya you ves, just let it. Ya ves, and, David, with me. And, en... and I'll just let it play itself. Okay. <laughs> okay, ¿quieres ayudarnos, Andrés, traduciendo un poquito y si algo yo Sí, sí, voy a, voy a, voy a, voy a, no, voy a, voy a primero editar y luego traducir. <laughs> que Lloyd tiene esa capacidad, Lloyd es alguien que coge una idea. Lloyd es un genio, a propósito, Lloyd es un genio eh, certificado. Él habla más de, él habla fluidamente muchísimos idiomas, 
aprendí a idiomas eh, rapidísimamente y además sabe tocar más de 100 instrumentos. Uno le da, él dice que uno le da un instrumento y lo puede comenzar a tocar inmediatamente. Entonces, esa, esa mente de Lloyd asocia varias cosas, pero básicamente a la pregunta de David, él responde que, que él no sabe si fue la CIA o fueron los rusos que lo pusieron como una celebridad de televisión en Irán, pero pues en la película eh, de todas maneras sí hay, una, hay un subtexto político en donde no sabemos bien cuál era el propósito de Lloyd en Irán exactamente, pero, pero lo, la verdad es que Lloyd es un, es un genio musical y la música es espectacular, es espectacular realmente, y y su talento musical se nota, o sea, digamos que la primera pieza musical que uno ve en la película es él toca todos los instrumentos en, algún, en distintos instrumentos de una de sus piezas más eh, como eh, significativas, que es Gole Gandón. Y, y bueno, lo él nos cuenta que no sé si fuera así o, la, o los rusos que pusieron ahí, la verdad es que se ganó una Fulbright Scholar para ir a Irán y en medio de esa Fulbright fue que el, las conexiones políticas de la familia lo llevaron al a NIRT, National Iran Radio and Television. Ella fue que lo, lo subieron al, al programa, Kurosh Ali Khan and Friends. Su nombre, Kurosh Ali Khan, fue, él fue nombrado en Geneva. En, sí, sí. en la película nosotros lo cambiamos, lo ponemos en Francia para, porque son muchos capítulos de la historia. Pero sí, a él en, en, en Europa, en su tiempo en Europa, es que uh -huh. lo llaman, él se autobautiza con la comunidad iraní, Kurush Ali Khan. Entonces, Lloyd Miller es un nombre en Sol Exit, pero cuando estuvo en Irán, su nombre fue Kurush Ali Khan. Okay. Right. Saint and Swinger. Tres sí. personajes diferentes. Uno no. fue uh, Kurush Ali Khan, el otro Lloyd Miller y el otro uh, Saint Swinger. Swinger. Y el otro, una mezcla de los dos. Dude. Lloyd es muy bueno. Lloyd es mormón. Sorry, Lloyd, go. Latter -day. go yeah, Latter-day Saint. Yeah, so you can be three types of people. So Saint, because a lot of times, you know, I'd go to Qom and I'd pray with people and uh, I'd be on my knees and praying and putting my head on the on the, on the ground. And, and, and I really believed it. And the same thing, if I went to Mashed, I went to the sacred shrine. Nobody said, thought this big tall guy, what is this? foreigner invading our shrine they would just nod i would nod and i'd say salam and they could feel that i was a believer i mean i didn't care i in india i go to some hindu things and and kind of pray with those people too hey we're all the same people we just have a different look, uh, view of stuff and the different view of stuff can become bad when we well negative when we think well my i'm better than you because i'm a muslim not a christian no i'm a christian i'm i'm better than you did jesus do that no he didn't go around saying i'm better than you because i'm a christian no he the whole thing is we're we're the same as you you know what i mean in different ways so we better get along and we better be friends and better care about each other instead of thinking well he's a muslim he can't be any good i'm not going to help him no, I think you go out of your way to help uh, somebody if they're different. And, and at first you think, hmm, maybe I shouldn't help him because he's a smoker or he's a, uh, you know, wife beater or something like that. No, it's, you got to go out of your way when you think there may be a reason that you can be of some use to people. I mean, it's all about what we can do, not what we can get or what we can give, not what we can get. People say, well, what are you trying to get out of your album? Album? Uh, well, I just threw it together. And what did I get out of it? Well, it cost me maybe 5,000 bucks to do it and give them all away to people. You know, I didn't get anything out of it, and even, even fame hardly, a little bit. And I, I wasn't doing it to get. You, you should do everything to give. And somehow you'll get something somewhere else. It'll come to you so that you can keep giving. As soon as you kind of stop giving, I notice, or slow down on the giving and the getting slows down too. It's sort of like, as you do, so shall you be done unto, or something like that. Uh, and I don't know if that's Islamic, Christian, or or or, or whatever, or uh, Hindu, or something, but it's everybody, right? Pues, pues Lloyd acaba de hablar básicamente sobre cómo él eh, tenía una flexibilidad, flex, era bastante flexible en su tema de las religiones, él no tenía problemas ni juzgar a nadie por su religión ni por su credo, y él es una persona que se considera bastante espiritual, a pesar de haber sido visitado varias veces por eh, lo, a quien él llama el diablo y quien uno encuentra eh, tangencialmente en la, en la película. Llámoslo así, yo creo, para la explicación. 
Sí. Okay. <risa> Una pregunta para todos, y es, um, ¿cómo el relato se construye no solamente a partir de lo documental, sino también sugiere que existe algo ficcional en él? Right? Uh, sí. ¿Qué tanto de lo que vemos sobre la vida de Lloyd es real? No quiero tirarme la película, <risa> pero, pero, pero quiero saber un poco sobre la construcción de la ficción en la peli. Pues la construcción de la ficción en la peli es la misma construcción de ficción que tenemos todos en cuanto a nuestra relación con la memoria. Ajá. Entonces, eh, la construcción de la ficción está ahí y está sobre todo en la manera como construimos nosotros nuestras propias vidas en relatos. Todos vivimos una vida que podría no ser pensada de una manera u otra, pero nuestra propia manera de entender el mundo trata de transformar esas experiencias en un relato coherente y lógico. Y digamos que cuando le contamos lo que nos pasó en el día de hoy a un amigo, pues hacemos como una sintaxis de eso y lo reducimos a una historia, eh, la que sea. Eh, entonces digamos que la historia de hoy está estructurada de acuerdo a la, a la memoria de él y al énfasis que él en su libro y en su propia narración le da a ciertos eventos de su vida. Um, tengo que irme, pero quería decir rápidamente que la figura de la madre de Loy, Maxine, es una figura yeah. tan fuerte en su memoria que, pues, gracias a los archivos de la familia, podíamos explorar um, los dolores y los desafíos que ha vivido Loy en su infancia y, pues, toda la vida, porque habla de su mamá como una como la figura del diablo que, que siempre se enfrenta en su camino. Y fue, sí, gracias a los archivos que podríamos explorar ese elemento. Sí. Y a propósito del libro de la mamá, Bright Blue Vets, uh -huh. de la familia que, sí. que se fue a... Uh -huh. right? Hablando de la ficcionalización, Bright Blue Vets es una ficcionalización de lo que era Irán en ese tiempo, por ejemplo. O sea, es como... Uno puede leer un libro sobre Colombia ahorita y uno decir como colombiano, esto es... Esto, Colombia no es esto. Esto es una ficcionalización. Bueno, es que sea mentira el libro necesariamente, sino que es una manera de ver que pronto edita eh, varias realidades del país para eso. Bright Blue Beats era un libro sobre el Irán de los años 50, que era de alguna manera una ficción bastante particular. Era el sueño americano vivido en la Irán de los años 50. Ok. okay. okay. Sí. Uh... Camila, Camila, a, a, a cuidar a nosotros. Muchas gracias a todos. Thanks, guys. Gracias. Um, enjoy the rest oh, of the day. Dale, dale. Cuidado. Sí, la gente piensa que um, Bright Blue, que okay, uh, mi, mi libro es en, uh, en copia de uh, mi madre's uh, um, Bright Blue Beats. No. It's, I didn't copy my mom's book and decide, I'm going to write a book. She wrote a book. I'm going to, I didn't even think about it. I just thought, hey, these okay. are good stories. And I wrote them all down in kind of a, a bibliography. Every night I would come home and do uh, uh, what happened today. And some of it was unbelievable. Like, wow, today I got to go to the shrine in Machete. Or today I got to do this. Or I met the head of the television, sat in his office, and he treated me like a, a pal and, and gave me all kinds of advantages in television and stuff. So I, I wrote all this stuff down. And when I got home, I just <clears throat> typed it all up, and that was a book. And uh, I haven't corrected it completely, but I've just recently recorrected what I had. And it was just a few spellings. And there wasn't a whole lot of stuff. Uh, just a couple of things missing. May I add something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, and I'm sorry, I, my Spanish is nil, so I am not understanding a lot. You may have already said this, but um, as he said, he didn't just sit down to write the book, but this is his journals that he kept over all these years, and I think you have both seen them, the journals. And uh, he just decided, you know, much, much decades later to make a book out of his journals. So what he read, and even now, he'll sit and read through those journals, handwritten in ink, you know, in little booklets, and he'll laugh and laugh at the things that he went through <laughs> and can't believe that he experienced some of the things he experienced and that he wrote about it at the time in real time. And now it's been, you know, all collected together to make Sufi Saint Swinger. Yeah, some people would say, well, being in a mental institution, being forced in there, 
being locked in there by surprise. Like uh, I just went one night and the doctor says, oh, why don't you sit down? We'll be right back. And I sat on the bed. I was locked in there for what, months? And, uh, and in shock treatments where every day you'd come from a shock treatment and people would say, hi, who are you? And say, I don't know. And I'd have to look in my wallet and try to pronounce my name. So I didn't know anything. And uh, people would be kind of angry. Well, I tried to uh, relate those things in the book in a funny way. It was all kind of funny, like the orderlies and how they helped me escape and all that stuff made it kind of fun, enjoyable experience because I, I tried to look at all this stuff in a funny way, even though it wasn't funny at all. It was kind of miserable. And so uh, and I tried to tell people that in Iran that, that hated the Shah or that hated Khomeini and said, well, dude, why are you wasting your time? Hey, why can't you have some fun and enjoy some of the funny things about these guys? Like the Shah's kind of a, a laugh sometimes and, and Khomeini is kind of funny, some of his speeches and, and let's enjoy this stuff. I mean, enjoy the good, enjoy the bad. It's all here for our experience so we can become better people, so we can find out from bad and having it bad happen to us Oh, well, maybe I shouldn't do that to the next guy. So I guess we learn more about good from having bad and even being bad. And so it's all for the best, I think. I don't think there's anything bad about this life, except, you know, being here <laughs> <laughs> and being broke. But what other than that, and being an unknown artist, I'm known by at least four people I can see. Uh, well, he and I discuss five. this quite often, <laughs> that he's sort of in a, what we would call, I guess, privileged position to be able to look at things like, you know, the Shah or Khomeini and something and laugh at it because it hasn't affected him. But uh, Could have, but, but, but I wasn't mad at him. He does even have that attitude. I love to tell the doorknob story, how we took a long, long, long trip one time. And it was, uh, we drove for 24 hours in the snow. It was horrible. We got home. The bedroom door was locked. And he's like, and I thought, oh, let's just sleep in the living room. We'll fix it tomorrow. Oh, no. He cut the doorknob off. He went and got a saw and sawed off the doorknob to the bedroom. I said, who cuts this doorknob off? And not only that, he says, you know what? I like it better this way <laughs> without the doorknob. Now, this is a guy who sees the glass half full, right? Not me. <laughs> Even awful. I, I was mean, like, how can you look at this like a happy moment? This is horrible. You ruined the bedroom door. It's like, no, it's better without the doorknob because, you know, I'm like, okay, that's Lloyd Miller. <laughs> I, don't, I just he, push it open. That's how he thinks, you know. <laughs> well, I got eventually got a doorknob that's better. Five years later, you yeah, got a doorknob. Better than the other. Yeah, it's kind of hard okay. to be with me. I kind of admire her. Uh, sticking with me all these years. Everybody else dumped me as fast as their their paperwork could. But <laughs> she's stuck in there. I don't know why, but she's really great. <laughs> so let's see. What else? Where were we going with all this? I forget. Maybe yeah, okay. Uh, Andres, estás muteado. No te estamos escuchando. <laughs> ya. Eh, perfect. Eh, no. Se consiguió el cometido que era que... Dale, David, sigue, sigue tú. Dale, ¿quieres traducir un poco de lo que dijo Lloyd? Pues eh, está complicado, eh, pero a grandes rasgos lo que Lloyd está diciendo es, ha, ha hecho un, un resumen muy amplio de algunas experiencias que le ha pasado por su vida, eh, que están en la película, que preferiría no decir mucho para quienes no la hayan visto, pero su, una infancia muy complicada, muy compleja, eh, también muy privilegiada al mismo tiempo. Luego, eh, el paso por Irán desde el Shah hasta Khomeini y lo que eso implicó y su posición política al respecto como de alguna manera. Y eh, Catherine agrega que él es un hombre que tiene una visión muchas veces muy optimista de la vida, eh, a pesar de circunstancias muy dolorosas, digamos que es como a grandes rasgos lo que, lo que dijeron. Okay. Ahí también está un poco, narra, narra, narra un poco sobre cómo fue esta representación uh, literaria que él tuvo y cómo nuestras experiencias y su experiencia de vida también está formada por, primero, por las experiencias de infancia, segundo, por un extranjero en Irán y de cómo ni siquiera, de esa imposibilidad de reconocerse con el otro porque no sabía ni siquiera decir su nombre. Entonces, cómo toda esta experiencia se traduce también en, 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 pues en su historia musical y su historia de vida, ¿no? Su, su pérdida de identidad también al principio, su desconexión y uh, 
problema de traducción y posteriormente eso se convierte en todo lo contrario cuando se vuelve TV host, ¿no? Exactamente. Eh, bueno, quería decir, en la película, eh, en algún momento, eh, la música se vuelve un tema central y pues claramente lo es, ya que uh, Mr. Lloyd es un músico talentosísimo. Quería preguntarles cómo fue uh, la búsqueda de la música dentro de la película, for Abbas and for, uh, y para Andrés. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo fue la búsqueda de la música de la película? ¿Qué tanto hay de, de la producción musical de Lloyd en la peli? ¿Qué tanto hay de la producción musical externa o colaborativa que tuvo Lloyd? Toda la música de la película es hecha por Lloyd. Hay algunos eh, clásicos de que son interpretaciones de Lloyd y son interpretaciones bastante particulares, algunas como con un toque oriental, eh, como es el caso de Summertime y otras eh, canciones. Eh, pero la, la, la gran mayoría de las composiciones de Lloyd están en, en la película, de las composiciones publicadas por Lloyd. Lloyd tiene varios LPs, eh, su más, eh, trabajo más popular es Oriental Jazz, eh, uno que se llama Oriental Jazz y que es excelente, y usted lo pueden buscar en Spotify y pueden conocer su música allá, y bueno, a través del documental. Y digamos que uno de los grandes trabajos que tuvimos, sobre todo en la reedición con Abbas, fue poder eh, dejar que las canciones realmente respiraran, que estuvieran las piezas en su gran mayoría completas y que tuvieran momentos donde uno estuviera viendo el archivo, digiriendo un poco lo que acabamos de oír de la historia y pudiendo como navegar a través de la música. Do you get that, uh, Abbas? About the yeah, the use yeah. Of music? yeah, I think I think the thing is because I was kind of thinking about it in in, in mind because I was thinking, you know, it isn't a literal. Uh, you know, kind of journey through Lloyd's book. It's not technically like that because it's also a kind of a, a reflection on his book. We are the listeners and he is the narrator. And I think, you know, the music is part of that psychology. The music is part of tapestry because I thought, you know, we are, we are as, as well, as, as Andres and Camilla, as the, as the filmmakers are making creative decisions about what it means to experience this story that Lloyd is telling us. And so the witnesses to this story are the people in the archives. But the moment that we make decisions about how we feel about this story, we are also held together by the music because there's also a very powerful honesty to the music. I think it's probably the most honest thing you can possibly have. It's Lloyd in his music is the most truthful. And I think that is the magic. Of, of everything. Uh, and I think that's why the music is the tapestry of the film. You know, we, we had to have that. We had, no matter what we thought about his life, no matter how Lloyd was trying to um, experience his life, uh, the music was there with us all the way through. It was a witness to the life. Uh, and I think that's why you cannot leave it. It is with you. It's, uh, you know, it's the thing that, that is the necessary element here. You know, and and that that's the gift of it because we are not all in the same position as Lloyd uh, to have this music that is the absolute truthful creation and witness to our life. You know, it's very that's why this kind of film is very special. Um, you know, because we have this gift from Lloyd. Okay. Yes, well, actually, actually, the music is Lloyd's language. Is I think that. This, the language that he speaks the best among all the different languages that he speaks is the language of music. Él comunica la lengua con la que nosotros, traduciendo un poco lo que Abbas dice, Abbas dice que eh, la música es como el, el, la base de la película de alguna manera porque es el lenguaje a través del cual Lloyd se comunica con mayor sinceridad y honestidad. Y, y eso, es, eso, es, eso es así. Y digamos que la música es el lenguaje que Lloyd encontró para comunicarse con otros en este mundo. Um, y digamos que esa es como la, la, la esencia de la película es musical finalmente y, y, si, y la música de Lloyd es oriental jazz, que es música oriental y música americana que es el jazz y la película funciona con esos dos con esos dos contrapunteos a lo largo de la historia digamos a propósito de eso te complemento uh, a sí, que él, uh, él es un narrador y nosotros los oyentes, y la música es parte de esa psicología, que me parece también que le da forma a cómo la, 
como realmente no importa lo que está pasando porque la música es quien está contando la historia, realmente, y a partir de la música conocemos la psiquis de, de Mr. Lloyd. Como hay tres, hay, Aquí, capas, hay, hay tres capas, está lo que escuchamos, que es la historia que nos cuenta, está lo que estamos viendo, que cuenta otra historia, y está la música que cuenta una tercera historia. Digamos que yo no, yo no planteo una capa por encima de ninguna, porque, porque si uno pone solo la música, se está perdiendo una parte de la historia. Si uno pone solo las imágenes, se pierde otra parte de la historia. Si uno pone solamente la narración, se pierde otra parte de la historia. Entonces, es una historia con capas. Como cuando uno está con un amigo que le está contando cómo está de bien y cómo le pasó súper bien en un día, pero uno ve que su cara está vuelta a nada, y la imagen cuenta otra. Cada elemento cuenta una historia distinta. Y por eso es que la película es una película que definitivamente yo definiría como una película de capas. Porque cada una de las dimensiones está dándonos una faceta distinta de la psicología del otro. Sí, es más fácil comunicar con la música. Sí. Either easier to, to speak with music than with words, I think. And so you're right. In fact, the guys who made this film have to be thanked and, and complimented because they took the whole spirit of everything the book, the story, the music and everything, and they put it into a film with all of that with it, without even trying because they were such geniuses. So I really have to thank you guys for doing that. It's a wonderful job. Oh, right, and then somebody has a question. What is your vision of current Iran? Everybody thinks, oh, Iran's horrible, blah, blah, blah. No, it's great. It's all part of history. And what influence? And what influence could the film have on today's Iran? Well, it could just show that it's cool. It, it don't you don't have to hate the Shah or, or love him. You don't have to hate Khomeini. You don't have to hate and love anybody. It, just hate and love God. That's plenty. I mean, if you can do that, you're doing pretty good. Otherwise, it's pretty hard to do any of these other stuff. Can music be a catalyst to a different? Uh, who wants some different new Persia? I like the old Persia. I like to go back to uh, 3000 BC. That's where the real Iran was. That's where the real uh, Europe was. Our people from Europe came from the Aryans, who were the Aryai was the Iranians who became Europeans, who became Americans, and so on, got worse and worse and worse. But they started out as this very noble, high, wonderful people, like you see in the Zenda Vesta, that have this love of each other and of spirituality. And if you read some of these old Zenda Vesta uh, prayers and stuff, it's, you just think, wow, that must have been a great place to be. And uh, I mean, I could recite some of them for you, but they, it, they're all very good. And it's that's I, I think that's kind of the real Iran. It, it kind of went downhill thanks to the West. But w before the West, it was it was kind of kind of okay. The Arabs weren't too helpful either because they were kind of selfish and they wanted to take stuff and not give. It's taking not giving that makes the world not as beautiful as it's supposed to be, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, we can yeah. always take. I just like to hand it over. Like somebody give me something, well, let's hand it over to who deserves it more or who needs it more instead of, ah, yeah, let's see how much I can get. Let's see that bank account go up. Ah, wow. Uh, well, then then the bank crashes in one. So that's not important. It's it's Your soul will crash too, but not the same as a bank. It'll move on, which is cool. But bank crashing isn't cool. But it's people about have you. all their care. Isn't that what you said, Lloyd? Uh, you know, it's not one thing or the other. It's it's both existing at the same yeah. time. You know, it's not it's yeah. either west or the east. It's both, and I think that's where you know, if you're talking about ancient Persia, um, and it it's it's ancient civilizations didn't didn't only crush other civilizations. They didn't uh, oppress and and erase they included them i mean you can even you know you can you can see in the food right the food is indian chinese all sorts all mixed together you know so i think that's the most important message from lloyd's music is that that you should not you shouldn't destroy one thing to create something else that you can actually have both existing and thriving yeah. together yeah good and bad they've got to be there if you don't have bad there ain't no good because then how do you know what good is if you haven't seen what it's like not to have it that's why we're here is to find out wow is that how bad that could be yeah dude this is, you get, you get used to it but you're not going to have to keep used to it because when you're dead it's going to be gone at least that much so anyway yeah it's 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 
Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. cool. And I, I really like some of those, you know, those, uh, those writings, the ancient Persian writings, where it's, it says, Thati Baga Wazwaka Daryavashyushkya Imam, or no, Baga Wazwaka Kya Imam Buma Bumim Ada. In other words, in the words of the great Lord who created this earth, who created mankind, Kya Matyamada. Yeah, Shati Ada Matyamya, who created happiness for mankind, and so on. So there's this kind of respect for everybody and for the person who created it, and bringing the person who created it down with us instead of like, oh, we'll never get there, and we, you know, have to worship this guy like that. No, he's one of us, and we're one of him if we want to be. I think it's all, it's, and we're just here for a moment, and then we move on to something else, and. Maybe I'll move out together at the end. Even the devil and those guys are going to give up their scene and come back and say, okay, okay, well, that was that was kind of fun trying to see if we can mess you guys up. And thanks for keep, keep, uh, welcoming us back in. I don't know. I mean, I try to look at the positive and the happy side instead of being against and mad at anybody. I mean, some of them yeah. you can feel like that. But um, mostly – I just don't watch TV that much, so I'm not that mad. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. Pero digamos que en términos generales, Loi responde a la pregunta que hace Jaime Alejandro Canales, que es cuál es la visión, Loi Diabas, de Irán en el momento y qué influencia puede haber tenido, qué puede, influencia podría tener la película en, el, en la Irán contemporánea. Y si la música puede ser la, el catalizador para, de una diferente nueva Persia. Y básicamente, al final, digamos que el resumen de la conversación que tuvieron Lloyd y Abbas es que eh, el imperio persa, al que Lloyd eh, como que quiere volver, que es el que es 300 años antes de Cristo, era un imperio que era incluyente y que la comida era mezcla de distintas culturas que que lograba llegar a tocar y que es, no es excluyente una cosa a la otra. Para tener algo nuevo no hay que destruir algo viejo y que justamente la música de Luis es un reflejo de eso, de eso mismo. Fantástico. Te quería, por acá llegó una pregunta y es a propósito de lo que hablabas de las capas, hay otra capa que uh, también hace parte de la película y es el diseño gráfico. Es, es uh, sí. todo el graphic design que aparece dentro de la peli y es también un motor y un motivo que acompaña la música, al metarrelato y, el, y la parte narrada. Sí, 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 eso es, eso, esa, esa, es una, esa es la letra de Lloyd de un álbum que él tiene. World Tour is the album that we got the, 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 your, your, the font of the. Remember the. Is, is it the, the album World Tour, right? Yes. Él tiene yeah. un álbum que no se ha escuchado nunca en su vida. Está impreso, él tiene el álbum, pero mm -hmm. y tiene la portada. Mm -hmm. eh, y de esa fuente mm -hmm. nosotros creamos toda una fuente de la, de la letra de Lloyd para destacar algunas palabras y algunas frases de Lloyd. De alguna manera, como, como él está leyéndonos mientras vamos eh, en la película, nosotros queríamos que de alguna manera sí hubiera un tema de la importancia de las palabras y el lenguaje dentro de la historia. El tema del lenguaje, por eso es que digo que no hay una... Es, o sea, tiene, tiene razón esa pregunta totalmente, porque no es la música únicamente, sino también está el lenguaje y el significado de las palabras. Y hay algunos, algunas maneras de Lloyd de escribir ciertas cosas que son fuertes o agresivas o particularmente... que resuenan particularmente a la historia. Y usamos esa capa gráfica para poderla como... como, como sí, llamar la atención para la audiencia en algunos momentos de la narración. Perfecto. Por acá estoy buscando más preguntas que han ido llegando. There is one for Loy. And is, how do you look back in perspective your life? Do you see your life as a fiction or, or as, a real, as a real motive, says here? Yeah. How do you look well, back in, in your life? How, how, how would you, you will describe yourself or your life well i think it's nothing nothing real special it's kind of different because living in lots of countries and uh i was just thinking of some of the parts of my book uh suddenly out of nowhere it's in finnish 
uh, or Swedish or Danish, which Danish is really hard to speak, but you can write it pretty easy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, wherever I was, I just decided to speak that language, whether I knew it or not. And uh, the hardest was like Finnish because that was uh, something like Turkish and Hungarian stuff. It's a whole different family of languages. And but since I knew that, I was kind of able to so how do you look pick, back at your life? pick up on some of that. So I look back on it as a chance to be everybody as much as I could. I mean, I didn't eat all their food because I'm a vegan and really strict about not putting dead animals and stuff in my mouth. But that's just personal, nothing against it. But uh, so I couldn't fit in that way. But I did before when I used to drink, smoke, swear and hang out with girls and eat whatever's on the table, no matter how bad. And uh, so I know what it's like. And I think I experienced enough of that. I had enough for one lifetime when I was 21, I quit and uh, quit almost everything. The girls are the hardest. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I look back on it. It's an experience of good and bad and enough bad to where I'm kind of glad I had the bad but I'm kind of glad that I don't have as much bad as I had had, if that makes sense. And yeah. uh, so, and I guess the older you get and the closer you get to death, the less bad you have to have until finally you die and maybe you don't have to have as much bad as you had had. Can I add something <laughs> to that? Yeah. yeah May I? Right, okay, so um, at age 81 and a half now, he does look back at his life, of course, and he's just marvels at the things that he was able to do. And it's wonderful that he was able to keep the journals, write the book and all of that. But another thing um, at our age, uh, we look forward and we wonder what is in a future for a person in their 80s, in their 70s, like me? <laughs> what, what's in our future? And it seems like every week there's some new adventure. It might be small and now a lot of the adventures are online. But uh, or by emails and communications with people around the world and and our friends and our family. And uh, so it's not over. Uh, he doesn't keep a journal anymore, unfortunately, because there are plenty of escapades he could write about the last 20 years or so. But uh, so, yeah, I think he looks fondly back at his life, if I may say that. And yeah. we hopefully look fondly toward a future, too. No, yeah, I really, hope, I really hope that the bad stuff I think about, like, oh, man, I'm really bad, is uh, stuff that, well, and you, and you hear about forgiveness and Jesus and how God is going to come out there and just say, well, what did you learn? Instead of, oh, you're going to hell. You're no good. You're bad. It, I kind of feel like he's going to be like a father, uh, like a really nice grandpa that comes out and puts his arm around you and say, well, what did you get from that? And well, I found out oh, I'm not so good, and it's got to be better. He says, "You're okay. Yeah, come on, we're, we'll we'll be we'll take you in, and that we won't be scolded. We'll be thanked and complimented and encouraged by some higher power. Otherwise, who would want that to be a god? I mean, there are countries and there are cultures that want God to be this horrible guy that's just shaking his finger at you and beating you over the head with a stick all the time." No, he's got his arm around us. He wants us to, to do better, and he wants us to want to do better, so he doesn't have to want us to do better. We can want it for ourselves. I think parents can understand that. When you see your child make a horrible mistake, you go, well, I still love you. What did you learn from that? And that's what we expect as children, who are older children, that that's how we'll be received, right? Let's hope so. We didn't yeah. know five or six years ago we were going to fall in love with two wonderful men called Abbas and Andres. Uh, but not, now we not, have not that kind of fall. Not love, romantic but, yeah. love. <laughs> <laughs> we have to add David and Camilla. 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 Yeah. yeah, they're really great people. I mean, I think of those those people often as some kind of saviors. Like uh, like you're in in this ditch in in you know this flood is coming and you're going to drown. Your life is 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 trash. And then you see these three guys that reach down and pull you up and shake off the water and dry you, put a towel around you, say, come on in and have some dinner. You know, I mean, that's what those guys have been. Uh, and uh, so I really appreciate it to have friends like that that didn't have to come in and make my story known because yeah. it's no biggie, but I guess it's got some good points in it. I hope it's got some points people can benefit from and learn, yeah. you know, how to I mean, 
be happy with the Shah, even if you don't like it. I no, like I, 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 ne I never, I never do anything about Iran, <clears throat> and uh, and the reason why I persisted in this project because in a way I, I think it's not a really about Iran. It's about, it's about America. Mm, I thought that, but I think actually it's just it's it's about an artist, about a, a human being. Um, but I thought it was also for us, um very um cathartic you know uh it was a very it allowed us to also express ourselves you know and and do it in a way that uh that also was able to you know uh destroy some demons i think uh and certainly i think you know with lloyd you know america is not the great monster of the world um and uh and, and, and you know i mean yeah, I mean, you know, in history. But the thing is, though, is, <laughs> but it's not about that. You can't just live uh, with these monsters. You have to, you have to put them aside and see what what there is. And I think that for me, it was wonderful to just reach out to to someone like Lloyd and Catherine and and do it so uh, wonderfully with Camilla and and Andres and uh, and you know in a in a, in a kind of a spiritual way also with Colombia, you know, because uh, it's is very important uh and to do it to do it like that to not just do it on my own to do it through one angle but to do it together because that was necessary i think it was necessary to have a conversation all of us together and so you know we have to thank each other in that way uh and as well as people who are watching the film uh which is which is even more amazing to to have the chance to share that uh, together uh you know so it's uh, it, it's some, it, it's a journey, and I think that journey is a, affects everybody in it. Um, you know, I think that my my worry always is as a producer is you have to make sure the people on the journey are the right ones uh, because it's gonna have to be a journey. We don't live a thousand years, so each time is precious, and so it's it's an honor to have the chance to do this. And as an Iranian, I feel I feel a little bit like uh, you know there was some exorcism or some demons there, so I, I appreciate it. You have to you have to stare it in the face, you know, huh? <laughs> Gracias. Okay, voy a intentar traducir la primera parte y tú me ayudas con la segunda, Andrés. Dale, dale, dale. Dale, uh, Lloyd habla un poco sobre cómo viendo su vida en perspectiva, no hay nada especial, solamente muchos países, muchos idiomas que aprendió, muchas lenguas que aprendió también a hablar, que estaban muy cercanas entre ellas y que eh, parecía obvio en su momento que si Hungría estaba al lado de algún otro país, era mucho más sensato aprender esa otra lengua y, y cruzar fronteras. Uh, pero entonces ve todo en perspectiva como una oportunidad, uh, que también hubo mucho drink, smoke and fuck, pero que renunció a eso en algún momento, pero que se trata de experimentar lo bueno y lo malo. Y está, hay, hay, hubo algo que dijo muy lindo y es... Um, I'm glad as bad as hat, you know, es, es como experimentar lo malo que puede ser y que se puede tener, porque eso eh, permite uh, ver todo en perspectiva y que cuando uno llega al, al terreno o al más allá, no se trata de encontrarse con una figura enorme y mala de un poder superior que te juzga y te dice que así no se hacen las cosas, sino que te encourage, como que te, te, te anima a ser mejor persona y creo que cuando uno llega ya es un, un, un compartir cuentas y decir esto fue lo que pasó, esto, esto no me gustó, que se viene, y, y ya eso, eso es lo que fue, eso es la vida. Y adicionalmente, Catherine, su compañera, agrega que no solamente la pregunta debería ir dirigida hacia cómo ve su vida en perspectiva, sino cómo la ven adelante, pues todavía no se ha acabado y porque ellos todavía siguen viviendo muchas aventuras, siguen viendo en el futuro, siguen preparados para todo lo que llega por emails y todo lo que llega a, a través de correos, y, y como que el viaje y la aventura todavía no se ha acabado, solamente el, solamente el diario. Exacto, y bueno, agregaría esa traducción que hiciste, eh, que Lloyd dice que él, porque la pregunta fue, si él siente que su vida fue una ficción, una realidad o, o qué fue. Y él dice que él aprovechó la oportunidad para ser el mayor número de personas que pudo. Y eso es cierto, lo vivió muchas vidas. Y Abbas agregó a eso que la razón, que lo que lo motivó a él a hacer la historia no era, él dice, nunca he hecho una película sobre Irán, pero esta me gustó porque no era sobre Irán exactamente, sino sobre un ser humano y un artista. Y a partir de hacer esta película logré exorcizar eh, varios demonios. Y yo agregaría eso, 
que también la motivación que yo encontré dentro de la historia de Lloyd, que es una pregunta que se hace cualquiera porque un colombiano llegará a esta historia de entre Estados Unidos y eh, Irán, y en el caso de Camila lo mismo, británica y mitad china, en el caso mío fue la historia de un hijo y una madre y la historia de un trauma. Eso es lo que para mí es la película y la historia de Lloyd Sufficient and Swinger, es la historia de un hijo, una madre, qué hereda el hijo de la madre, cuál es el trauma y cómo lidiar con ese trauma a partir de, de ese momento. Esa es la historia que yo, con la que yo personalmente me conecté cuando conocí a Lloyd. Ok, I think it's over. Yeah. It's time. Just a one last message is uh, told us is possible. Does that make sense? Pueden, toda la gente pueden tocar el cello, tocar el French horn. You just have to hand it to them and they can do it. They just handed it to me and I said, okay. They says, you're going to be playing in five minutes. And I said, great. I didn't even think, I never touched this before. Or I met in a cello. Ooh, I just did it. I don't care. And, and you watch the video. You don't know that this guy's never seen that instrument before five minutes before the show. Well, it's not on, on a stage, but never had it in his hands. So it, you can do anything. I mean, look, we drive cars. I mean, that's not that easy, but we've learned how. But you can just pick up on stuff and, and not be afraid of it. That doesn't mean you should just jump in a big, huge truck and, and start going fast downhill. I mean, it's kind of nice to take it easy the first few tries to see what you're doing. But everything, everything's possible, right? Okay. Todo es posible. Pueden tocar el cello, pueden tocar el, el, el corno francés, pueden saltar de un camión si quieren, aunque realmente no se los recomiendo. Y adicionalmente, todos aprendimos a manejar, que al parecer no es tan fácil. Entonces, todo es posible. Muchísimas gracias, Lloyd. Thank you so much, Abbas. Thank you so much, Andrés. Thank you. Gracias, David. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Bye. Gracias. Chao. Chao, chao. Bye. Bye. Thank you.